Some of you know that I grew up on the farm as a little kid in Minnesota, and I was warned. There were cornfields everywhere and soybean fields. Cornfields, of course, got tall, over six feet, and soybean fields and alfalfa fields and wheat fields and oats fields. But we were told as a kid, don't get lost in the cornfield because some kids will wander off and go play in the cornfield and get confused and not know where to go. And the corn can run, those are half a mile, uh, can be a half a mile in each direction. And so a little kid was wandering and there are stories where they just couldn't find a little kid who wandered into a cornfield and they'd find all the neighbors who'd get together and they would walk the rows through tall corn. And of course it canopies over, so it's only clear for about two feet and then it's all, so it was very difficult. So I remember that as a kid. Don't get lost in the cornfield, but if you do, and kids will play, so if you do, go to the end, follow the row to the end of the field and then wait, because then somebody can find you. You don't go crosswise, you'll be all over the place. So, so <clears throat> sure enough, I was a little kid, I had to try that out, and, uh, and yeah, I went to the end of the field and then I could find my way home again. Well, have you ever been lost while hiking in the woods? Some people get lost and... And I know that I learned one thing is when you're hiking, look back once in a while to see what it looks like on your way back. So you can kind of find your way back, uh, kind of give a, a mental view of what it's going to look like on your way home. And this was many years ago. I was hiking in the Oregon Cascade Mountains and with a group of uh, guys, and we had made it to the summit of one of the mountains near Bend, Oregon, the South Sister, and I was feeling pretty rough. I mean, this was, my hips and legs weren't, I was used to an office job, and all of a sudden I'm out there, uh, a, ste a steep climb, and I thought, I'm going to head back a little early. And so I headed back, and then which exactly, which route was it on the way back? You know, it became a little bit of a challenge. I think it's this way, and I'm hoping, hoping that I can do that because you don't want to go up and down when your legs and hips are already hurting. Uh, it was a six or seven mile hike after coming up a steep incline and then across the plateau and then another one to 2,000 feet up the mountain. So I'm, my hips are hurting pretty bad. And okay, I'll, I'm going to take the easiest route and hope that hope that makes it. And it was so exciting to find that I had picked the right, ultimately the right place. Because otherwise, I'd, this is before cell phones and GPS, and I'd just been lost out there in the, in the wilderness. So it's, it's no fun being lost. Ever been lost in a car? What about lost in a car at night? Even worse, on back roads of a car where there's nobody coming by and there's no good help or somebody. Well, that's a bummer. I know that in growing up, we had maps, folding maps. Now, you can pretty well say that you're a genius if you can refold the map in the way that it was originally folded. <laughs> Nowadays, kids don't even know about those map folding exercises. But we had maps, folding maps of all kinds of places, and we kept them in the dining room. Remember, in the parents' house, in a little cabinet in the corner, on the left side of the cabinet. And today, if you walk into our house, in the dining room on the cabinet on the left side in the corner, you're going to see all the maps. Amazing how that still works out uh, over time. But the maps are critical. And even now, we carry a map book in the car when we're on a trip. Because what if electronics just doesn't work? So we have map book, and map books can get out of date. So we have, so I've gotten uh, uh, more than one map book. Now, of course, first came GPS devices, global positioning system. So we have a Garmin, we have a Magellan system, two big companies, and, and in order to find our way. But nowadays, of course, we have smartphones. So we just look at Google Maps and punch in what our destination is, and then it'll show us the advice for the quickest route. It'll even give us warnings uh, if there's traffic slowdowns or maybe... Uh, uh, speed traps and so forth, uh, in order to be able to, or road blockages, accidents, in order to get where we want to go. But of course, if we want to get where we want to go, we really actually have a place that we have to go or want to go. And the author, uh, many years ago, author Zig Ziglar, uh, said, this was an interesting quote, and I'm 
when he said, are we a wandering generality or a meaningful specific? Are we a wandering generality? Just wandering through life, uh, whatever happens, happens, or a meaningful specific? Do we have some particular idea or goals in mind? And he tells the story, and I have the, the tapes from <clears throat> 30 plus years ago, uh, where he said he took the world's greatest archer, you know, with an excellent uh, bow and arrow skills, and you blindfolded him, put a blindfold on him, and then spun him around a few times, and do you suppose he could hit a target that he couldn't see? Well, it's kind of highly doubtful. Then Zig Ziglar asks, how could he hit a target that isn't even there? So in other words, there's got to have, we all need a target of some sort of, of, in order to get where we're going. Otherwise, we will be what? That wandering generality instead of a meaningful specific. Also about that time, there was Robert Ringer wrote several books. One of them is called Looking Out for Number One. And he had the best definition of reality that I've uh, found. He said, are you achieving your objectives? To determine if you're realistic, you're you should be achieving your objectives. If you're not, then you're not taking everything into account that you should, and you, what you say are your objectives are just talking inside your mind. So the question is then, is you getting where you want to go? Well, physically, the physical path of our footsteps, whether it's by plane, train, automobile, or however, uh, uh, that's, we pretty much know, have an idea where we're going when we head out. Now, Nowadays, we have, and I know that I first saw this in, in uh, Europe, in Eastern Europe, they have screens on the backs of the seats of the bus. So you're sitting on the bus, and then you can look at the GPS screen, and you can see where you've been, where you're going, and it's really quite remarkable to be able to watch that. You can do the same thing on airplanes now. They have the little uh, uh, screen on the back of the plane uh, seats, and you can look on it, you can see where you're going and the global positioning system will show you where you're at, where you're going. Of course, some of us get diverted from time to time. We're not looking at the screens or not looking at a map. We get lost in the wilderness. Uh, you might want to turn to Matthew 13 in a, uh, in a moment, Matthew 13, 44. So, but we're all on a path in life, not just a physical path, but in a path so we can be helpful to reinforce each other. Because we're on, when we're, we're on a path, to go somewhere, it's kind of nice to know that you're on the right path and that you've got somebody who says, yeah, yep, that's right. You know, go down the road, take a right. Now my <clears throat> One of my grandmothers was, was not really good at giving directions. You go down the road until you see the little red house. Well, it's not red anymore. It used to be red. And then you turn, and then there's a broken wagon in the yard about two or three blocks down. Of course, the wagon is gone, but, you know, and you can, she would give instructions and you'd never really find it. You'd really have to find somebody else to help you to explain uh, where to go. But in life, we can help other people to build each other's way or faith up uh, in our way of life to follow God's plan for salvation. And one way to maintain our faith is to remember how we got where we are. So when we meet other church members on the Sabbath uh, or in social events, it's helpful if we ask them, to, well, you know, when we inquire of each other, tell us about the time when you first started coming to church, uh, when you first became aware of the truth. And all of us have a story. It's a unique story. It's our own lives and how we were called by God, uh, answered the call of God, and learned the truths of the Bible. And then we learned our destiny. Well, the Bible has a number of examples of how people became converted to the truths of God, how their minds were turned. And some people just stumble over the truth, <laughs> just like a pure accident, like falling down the stairs in Matthew 13, 44. In Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven, this is a parable spoken by Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then his joy went in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Now, in this particular parable, Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God to a treasure in the field. It's something that's valuable. Now, the guy was just walking across the field. 
He wasn't particularly looking for that. He was going somewhere, but he wasn't looking for that particular treasure. He just stumbled upon it. And the man recognized then, ta-da, he recognized the treasure for what it was, and he determined whatever he had to do to obtain that treasure. And if you notice the reference in the last half of the verse, he said he sold all that he had and he bought the field. All of the things in this life that he that he had were not worth as much as that treasure in the field. And of course, Jesus is referring to that treasure as the kingdom of God. Now, yesterday I was talking with one of my daughters on the phone. She's a treasure hunter. Now, she shops garage sales, estate sales, uh, looks for valuable items she can sell on her eBay store. Uh, she will buy pieces of furniture, refinish them, and sell them for multiple times more than what she bought them. And she's a full-time stay-at-home mom, and she makes hundreds of dollars a month just part-time supplementing the family income. Well, yesterday, she said she sold a ceramic teacup she purchased for six bucks at an estate sale. So she did the research and says, hey, I've got something here for this particular pint of powder. And said, hey, this is, looks like it's pretty valuable. So she put it uh, up on an eBay auction, and she said, a lot of other ones are going for a pile of money, so I'll put a very stiff price on it and see what happens. So she posted it for 575 bucks. She bought it for six and to see what would happen. Well, she called me up yesterday and says, hey, Dad, uh, I mean, I, I just gulped the whole thought of a, 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 you know, some ceramic, antique ceramic teacup for 575 bucks. But apparently multiple people wanted it because she said, I sold it for over $1,000. Uh, and so uh, I recommended highly to her that she do that again. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so she's always on the lookout for a good deal. But if we look at this treasure in the field, he recognized the treasure and he made a sacrifice and was willing to give up everything else. Now, but he wasn't looking for it. It just stumbled across it. We looked at Matthew 13. We go to the next verse. In verses 45 and 46. In verse 45, And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Well, it's just like the parable of the treasure in the field. The parable of the merchant and the pearl of great price demonstrated the importance of recognizing value. And in those parables, the kingdom of God was the treasurer or the treasure or the pearl of great price. Now, some people just stumble across the knowledge of the kingdom of God, and other people are diligently searching for the truth, and they find the knowledge of the kingdom of the God. Well, the question then becomes for us is, which path are we on? Are we just stumbling along in life, or are we diligently seeking the truths of God so that, uh, uh, and, and then finding the knowledge of the kingdom of God? Well, each person's story is different. I wasn't particularly searching. Uh, I just felt like I got hit by a comet. Whoa, is this really so? Uh, and by that time, I was an adult. So the description of the path to conversion of people to primitive Christianity is put in a curious way in starting in Acts 9. And we're going to read about one person's conversion to what we call primitive or early Christianity in Acts 9, and starting in verse 1. And there was a fellow named Saul. Now, he was a Pharisee, uh, called himself a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, as we heard in the sermonette. And Acts 9 and verse 1, Saul breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now, bear in mind, this was just after the stoning of the early Christian Stephen. And Saul was persecuting the early Christians. And so he was very vigorous about it. And so what he did in Acts 9 and verse 1, he went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found, next country over in Syria, if he found any who were of the way, meaning a Christian, or their man or woman, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Take them as prisoners. They can be questioned and may be killed. Well, the term the way describes those who respond to God's calling, 
to follow the, Jesus Christ and the gospel message of the kingdom of God. You might say the early Christians, the way, were actively searching for the pearl of great price for the kingdom of God. Well, the man named Saul in the book of Acts felt threatened by people who were of the belief system that they, they referred to as the way. I find it's interesting that those who are not followers of God and God's plan for salvation of mankind feel so threatened by the truths of God and they feel threatened by people who are followers of God. And we've seen that pretty much all over the place, all over the world, that people are very hostile to the truth. Well, today we're going to look at the paths to this belief system, the paths to the truth or the way. And we're going to start at the, about Saul from the book of Acts, what he found so threatening. So the title of this message is, Which Way Are We Going? Which way are we going? I'm going to do something unusual. I'm going to quote a Chinese philosopher about 500 BC, and his name is Lao Tzu, L A O T Z U, Lao Tzu. And he said a, a statement that many of us have heard before, heard repeated The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Got to start somewhere. If you're going to make that trip, you got to start. Now, he was lived at the same time that the Chinese philosopher Confucius did, about 500 years before the time of Christ. He's the founder of a, a religion or belief system called Taoism, which literally interpreted in Chinese is the way or the road. And basically he said, you're not going to get where you're going unless you get busy and take those first steps, which is a universal truth. And of course, it's, a, it's essential that you step in the right direction. Just making a step for the sake of going somewhere is not going to be helpful. Even if you're only just one degree of deflection off, just a little bit, that's, you're not going to notice it from here to the end of the room or here to the end of the building. But the farther you get from where you are, the, uh, from, that, from the path, uh, toward the kingdom of God. If just a little bit off, you're going to be wandering off to the side and you're not going to reach your destination. Now, what this means is we have to choose our path wisely. Now, there are a lot of types of roads throughout history and first most roads started as a path. People would walk on them, ride them on horseback, maybe trails, uh, basically dirt roads. Uh, later, as, as wagons and carts were developed, then, then it was improvement uh, to some of those roads uh, over time. I know in early America, in the 1800s, there was a lot of road building going on. And they would have horse-drawn <laughs> scrapers. Uh, uh, horses would pull scrapers. Even my great-grandfather and my grandfather used those for farm roads, is that they'd have a scoop dragging behind a, a team of horses. Well, they've used that for hundreds of years. They built the national road with that, early American did, from the Potomac River in Washington, what is now Washington, D.C., Maryland, all the way to the middle of the country to about 100 miles from St. Louis, Missouri. Now, I've, re I've driven that, okay? That's a long way, but they made a road. In other words, they filled in the low spots. They called them a highway, where they scraped it up so you wouldn't be going through mud all the time, and the rain would come off of it. And they could travel in wagons that were pulled by horses or oxen. There weren't improved roads or bridges uh, uh, until they got there. And along this national highway that the government, uh, when the first national highway, the government uh, helped to improve, every five miles or so, there was a, uh, a little store, maybe a tavern or an inn, a blacksmith shop to reshoe horses and so forth. Regular stops along the way. But there was some improvement of that road. But that was early America, and then another generation later became the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail, where people left their homes in civilization in the east, and they traveled by wagons, and they traveled to the west coast. <clears throat> there weren't any improved roads. There were no bridges to cross the rivers. And they went in wagon trains, and there usually were some scouts along. So when they came to a river, how are you going to cross the river? Well, there's usually a shallow place to afford to cross. So they would have the scouts on horseback find a shallow place on the river. Uh, places like the Mississippi, after they crossed the Mississippi or the Missouri, they would have barges, build a barge and, and go across. 
But going across the uh, prairie and out west through the mountains, people some people starved to death. Others were attacked by wolves. Others were by attacked by indigenous peoples there. Babies were born along the way. People survived the journey and thrived when they reached the other end, Oregon and California and other western states. Now we can drive on Interstate 80 or Interstate 84, and I've driven the same distance from the Midwest to the West Coast in a little over two days. Just get in and go, and the roads are good, and, and put the foot down, and you can make it a long ways. But the trails and roads physically have improved for thousands of years. Roman highways, deep road beds, cobblestone or flagstone, fitted stones, uh, well, and there's, some of those are still good today. Of course, some of you may have seen Wizard of Oz in the yellow brick road. Uh, bricks, in other words, make a firm roadbed, a good way to go. Went to the feast some years ago in Germany and visited a little town of Freiburg. And the streets and sidewalks were paved with colored mosaics that really is a quite remarkable sight. It's only 22 miles from the current feast site in, in Lake Tatize in Germany. Uh, and those mosaics uh, of those tile were memorials to the Jews killed in the Holocaust. But the roads can be, they've improved from gravel to asphalt to concrete. We even have the German Autobahn. We have divided highways, expressways, freeways, tollways. Closest one here, I think, is the Cherokee Turnpike. They all have something in common. It's a way to get where they're going, a path to your goal. There are three stories in the Bible where people have responded to the call of God in different ways. And the first example I want to quote today uh, is the story of the conversion and baptism of the, of the tribe of Israel. And this is when they came out of Egypt and went through the wilderness to Canaan, the promised land. They didn't take a road or a highway. There wasn't any. Uh, I'm not even sure there is today <laughs> through that area. And But they had a goal. They had a destiny. They had some place to go. And if we read Exodus 14, they crossed the Red Sea. If we go to Exodus 16, they were hungry. They had manna. Uh, Exodus 17, they got water from the rock. Exodus 18 through 32, uh, those chapters, Israel received the Ten Commandments Basically, the rules for a happy life. <clears throat> in Exodus 33, we read what God gave directions on how to go to the promised land about you need to go there and I will drive out the people that are, are occupying that the weeds, as it were, uh, in that area, so that you can go to a land flowing with milk and honey. It's in Exodus 33, verse 3. Go go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. And he gave them a process on how to do it in Numbers 13, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. In Numbers 13, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the children of Israel. From each of the tribes of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So 12 tribes, there's 12 spies. And then there was a report that came back. And they were gone for 40 days. And there was a mixed report in Numbers 13, starting in verse 27. And some of them said, yeah, yeah it's, it's got the land of milk and honey. When you stop and think about it, what does it take to produce milk? Domesticated livestock. Uh, and that means there has to be enough to support the livestock. And what does it uh, mean for a land of honey, well, that means there are bees and flowering plants that you can have in order to produce the honey. And both of those, by the way, at that time, now, the bulk of the milk was probably sheep and goat milk uh, at that time, which is highly digestible uh, for humans. And as we know, honey stores well and is very digestible. And in Numbers 13, 27, it says, and this is its fruit. In other words, that's the productivity of the land. And it gives the warning, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and large. We saw the descendants of Anak, meaning there were giants. Uh, and, and it goes on. And so it was a mixed bag report. But Caleb and Joshua were somewhat more enthusiastic. In Numbers 13, verse 30, 
uh, and Numbers 13, 30, and Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we're well able to overcome it. Like, let's go. God said to do it. He's going to help us. Let's do it. But the two of the spies gave the good report, Caleb and Joshua, but the other 10 were afraid. They didn't do it. They saw the obstacles and they were fearful. We look at Numbers 13, verses 31 and on. <clears throat> they were saying, whoa, they were saying, wow, we saw giants. You know, this is just way, way too scary. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So were we in their sight. Now, I'm looking at me, I'm thinking of me and looking at a grasshopper, okay? And so they're thinking, we look like grasshoppers. Pretty small, pretty insignificant. And when the 10 spies said that, in Numbers 14, uh, and starting in verse 1, that spread fear among the Israelites, among the people. Now they're all afraid. God said to go up to this promised land. They've been going through all of these experiences. And verse 2, and or verse 1, people lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. Verse 2, and all the people of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said, now mind you, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's select a leader and return to Egypt. They gave up. They forgot the dream. They forgot the goal. They forgot everything about why they were where they were and what God expected of them. And so in Numbers 14 and verse 26, and <clears throat> we read, and God says, how long do I have to be patient with these people? I've done all of these things for them, miracle after miracle, fed and watered them, guided them, and uh, defeated their enemies before them when they came out of Egypt. And <clears throat> so then uh, in verse 29, he said, all the complainers, are going to die in the wilderness. They didn't want to go forward, and I'm not sending them back. So for the for uh, uh, for everybody who's 20 years old and a legal adult and above, they're just going to, who complained, they're just going to die in the wilderness, except for the spies, uh, Caleb and Joshua. And so in other words, that entire generation of time will have to pass, those 40 years. Uh, verse uh, uh, 34, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years. <clears throat> so it's, they're going to be in 40 years and they will all pass along. Now, in other words, they're going to live in tents. Life is going to be hard and they're going to have God's laws repeated to them. There will be, they had manna in the wilderness, but it didn't fall on the seventh day. So it's six days of the week. Water would be available to them. They would be protected uh, uh, from enemies. Uh, and their clothes didn't wear out, which I find interesting, and their shoes while they were in the wilderness. But they refused to, to reach out and, and take what God had promised them, the promised land. Well, after the passing of Moses and that entire generation, in Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, we have instructions, what God gave to Joshua on how to enter the promised land. And in Joshua 1, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over the Jordan, the river, and you and all the, this people to the land which I'm given you. And he gave instructions to do so. And then, it's interesting, in Joshua 4, starting in verse 20, he was... He had selected the process by which they did that and put stones uh, to cross the river so they could do it on dry, dry uh, stepping on dry ground. And, and verse 23, the Lord God dried up the waters of the Jordan as he did to the Red Sea, which was be over 40 years before. So there was another crossing. Before it was crossing the Red Sea, now it's crossing the Jordan. So in this example, God provided in number one, uh, example, God provided the food, the water, and the security for the Israelites on their path to the promised land. That God gave the Israelites the guidelines for happy living, the Ten Commandments, but most of them thought the path was just too hard. 
it was too hard to step forward and actually take what God had promised them. And they perished in the wilderness, and it was their descendants that entered the promised land. Well, this is a metaphor for Christians. The path we are on to the kingdom of God is strewn with challenges. Yet God provides for us along the way. We have to be careful then to follow God's instructions and be willing to do whatever it takes. Remember that uh, the, uh, the parable of the a treasure in the field or the pearl of great price. Whatever it takes to obtain the treasure, which is the kingdom of God. So we have to do like the merchant, have to recognize the pearl, what's valuable, and do what it takes. Some people, it's a slow, hard process because they're resistant like the Israelites in the wilderness. It's just too hard. For some people, like the next generation of Israelites, they boldly follow God's instructions in, to Joshua, proceeded into the promised land. God collapsed the walls of Jericho uh, and they proceeded to occupy that promised land. So that's the first example. The second example, I'm going to turn to Acts 9 starting in verse 1. And what had happened here was in Acts 9 uh, and verse 1, I'll give the background, the Jews of that day had were seeking to imprison and even kill the early Christians. And one of the early Christians that was killed was named Stephen, uh, and who gave a powerful speech, and a Pharisee named Saul was complicit with the killing of Stephen. In Acts 9, verse 1, we now read what comes right after that. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he was determined, and he was actively pursuing uh, anybody who followed the way. Verse 3, Acts 9, verse 3, As he came to Damascus, a light shone about around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now imagine us. We're walking down the road. Uh, I don't know if it was, uh, I presume it was by foot. Uh, and Damascus, uh, Syria, is a long way from Jerusalem. And so he's not quite to his destination. And then, in the middle of the day, the sun shone so bright, he was struck blind. Well, I'm used to seeing, and if all of a sudden I were struck blind, you're totally dependent on someone else. Just that. I mean, you're not, <laughs> which way are you going to go? Uh, you don't know. And then you hear a voice you've never heard before that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, obviously, Saul is curious, more than curious, desperate. You know, who are you, Lord, meaning master? Obviously, whoever could see him uh, was his master at the moment. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, most people don't may not realize what a goad is. A goad is a sharp stick when an ox pulls a cart. They put uh, 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 some sharp sticks, affix it into the cart. Because I've raised with cattle, and some of them are rather stubborn. Okay, most of them are rather stubborn. And they don't always go forward. Well, you can't really operate in, in a cart very well. Uh, and you can even beat some of them half to death, and they will still want to back up and turn around. So they put little sharp sticks behind on the cart, so if the ox backs up, he's going to back it with a sharp stick. And it's amazing how a sharp stick on the backside of, of an oxen will make it decide to go forward. Uh, and so, but sometimes they're upset with it and they kick back. Sharp stick and they kick back. And what is Jesus saying? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Those sharp prickly sticks. Paul was doing that when he was persecuting Christians. Verse 6 in, uh, in Acts 9. So he, meaning Saul then, trembled astonished and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? In other words, okay, you got my attention here. Obviously, I need to get out of this predicament, so what should I do? 
uh, and continuing on in verse 6, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. That'd be kind of odd, wouldn't it? How many of us are walking down the street and we're struck blind and somebody's talking and the people with us aren't struck blind, but we can all hear the same voice. Well, verse 8, Saul rose from the ground. When his eyes were open, he saw no one. Look around, right? Where's that voice coming from? But they, meaning the, his people with him, led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, uh, neither ate nor drank. Now you can live about three days without water and then you collapse. I would probably collapse a little sooner than that. Uh, I like to drink a full pint of water when I wake up every morning and just not a good thought to go three days without uh, food or water. And if we read in Acts 9 verses 10 through 19, uh, there was a member of the way, Ananias, a Christian, and he was instructed to find this Saul of Tarsus, this man, and uh, and to help him. And in and, and verse 15, and the Lord said, For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. That's a pretty big function. What if the Lord said, for he, meaning fill in the blank, your name, was chosen, a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. What if we were the ones that were selected or chosen? Uh, and then it goes on, verse 16, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. What was Saul doing? He was making Christians suffer. And now what was going to happen? He was going to carry the same gospel of the kingdom of God to Gentiles, to kings and Israelites, and in so doing, he was going to suffer. In verse 17, Ananias laid his hands on Saul and, and asked Saul be filled with the Holy Spirit. He received his sight. Uh, and verse, what, 18, there immediately fell from his eyes something like scales, and Saul received his sight at once, and he was arose and then was baptized. Saul was made a believer. Imagine that. Go three days without food or water. You think God had his attention? Couldn't see. He could only hear. And verse 19, in Acts 9, 19, when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Now, don't you suppose they were rather shocked? If uh, if somebody, you might say a government agent, who was killing people from this congregation and similar congregations, and he was hunting them down, and then he showed up in our door, and we knew who it was, uh, we might be a little twitchy, right? We might be a little nervous. And then he says, no, no, it's all fine now. You're going, wait a minute here. I'm not so sure about this. Who, uh, who do you say you are again? <laughs> and so Paul had uh, spent some days, it says, with the disciples at Damascus. And verse, in Acts 9, verse 20 says, immediately he, meaning Saul, preached the gospel. Well, that's kind of astounding. Here's somebody who is contributing to the torture and murder of Christians, and all of a sudden this turnaround where he is preaching the kingdom of God and uh, uh, the message of Jesus Christ. And verse 21, isn't this the guy who destroyed those who called on this, this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, that he might bring them bound to the chief police or chief priests? Uh, and it confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus. And Saul increased in strength. So now, you suppose that uh, Saul then was popular with the Jews who sent him there? Nope, nope. They were confounded. How can this be? This was, this was our hatchet man. He's going to go there and clean out these wild heretics that they call the way, the Christians. Uh, and verse, uh, in Acts 9 and verse 28, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. We've got to get rid of this problem. 
Apparently, they had no problem with violating that uh, 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 that one of the Ten Commandments. We got a problem. We'll just kill them. That'll take care of it, right? That was that's what they were doing with Stephen and others. They would just kill him. But what did the disciples do in verse twenty-five? Christians took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. He was able to escape, meaning they had the doorways all watched, the city walls watched, but he was able to escape. So what does Saul do? He goes back to Jerusalem, where he came from. And who's going to believe him there? And verse 26, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Well, that's a big shock, right? Walks in the door and says, I'm here. Uh, who's going to believe him? Then he claims to be a Christian now. Uh, verse 27 in uh, Acts 9, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And then he went and explained what had happened, how he had had, how he had, uh, had the experience uh, with Jesus on the road to Damascus, how he preached the gospel of Jesus in Damascus. And, and in verse 29, they, how the Hellenists attempted to kill him. Uh, so when the local uh, people in Jerusalem found out that you know, he had, there was a death wish for, or a death warrant for him, they brought him out, went to the seacoast in Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus, Asia Minor, where he came from. So you have this, Saul so had this road to Damascus experience. This has almost become a metaphor for somebody who's had a big change of mind or a change of heart. And you say, whoa, he had a road to Damascus experience, like it was, was going one direction, and now he's going a very different direction, a very big difference. Uh, <clears throat> if we read in Acts 9, we're down to go to, go to uh, verse 31, the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Didn't have Saul coming in to try to kill him anymore. And they were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They multiplied. It doesn't say they added. They multiplied. <clears throat> Flip over to Acts 22. And we have the Saul, who's now called Paul. And of course, they're still nervous because, you know, here's this guy who was killing uh, Christians earlier. Uh, in Acts 22, in verse uh, uh, 2, when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept the more silent. And he said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, in modern-day Turkey, uh, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, he was, uh, uh, you might say, a Pharisee or a teacher of Pharisees. And he says in verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons men and women, as the high priest bears me witness. Uh, I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there and bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. So he was saying, yep, this is my history. How many of us are quite willing to say, well, that's our history. It used to be hostile. Uh, and now it's a very different world. And he goes on to explain how the bright light came, how he was struck blind, uh, and so forth. And he goes and he recounts that in Acts 22. Uh, and if we take a look, <clears throat> then... Uh, if we, if we take a look uh, in Acts 22, in verse uh, 17, he's describing his return to Jerusalem from Damascus. He said, and he was praying in the temple uh, that I was in a trance. So I'm saying, get haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony. And, uh, because it, and it goes on to explain how they, they knew that he was uh, guilty of the blood of the martyr of Stephen, among others. And what does God say uh, in verse 21, Acts 22, 21? Depart, for I will send you from here to the Gentiles. In other words, it's, it's not going to be effective for you to preach here. You need to go preach to the Gentiles. Acts 26, starting in verse 9, Paul's then named Paul uh, said, I thought myself... I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. 
No, that was his earlier mindset. Uh, and he goes, uh, verse 11, I punished them in synagogues, compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He was widely known. Well, kind of reminds me, it was many years ago, my pastor was giving a sermon. And he said he had gone to visit a member of the congregation. He said, you know, it's not always being easy being a pastor. So when he came to a home, uh, he was met at the door by a man with a shotgun. And he said it was a non-member husband who had threatened the minister with a shotgun and encouraged the minister to leave. And the pastor says, so he thought it would be a good idea to leave. You see, this young husband didn't grow up in the church, but he married a gal who did grow up in the church. And the young married woman continued to come to church while her husband was hostile to the church, which is a kind of a good reason not to marry outside the church, marry somebody with a belief system. Well, I remember that sermon uh, many decades ago, and I was chatting with a young fellow about my age. We were in our mid to late 20s at the time. And I was saying to the guy, wow, isn't that really something about the minister who was threatened with a shotgun at the door? And my friend kind of hung his head and he says, yeah, that was me. Uh, but God had given him a road to Damascus experience. Uh, hard to forget that one. But it was quite unusual, but had, uh, he had decided to turn his life around and go with the truth. So in Acts 26, Paul continued to recount his conversion. He had journeyed in verse, 11, or verse 12 in Acts 26. He went to Damascus with authority and commission from the high priests. So uh, there are some people that, that worship authority without regard as to where that authority comes from. Really, the only authority is from God and through his scripture. And so he was saying, I had the authority so I could go do all of these things. Uh, and so he recounted that in Acts 26. Uh, <clears throat> but in Paul's post-conversion life, it's described in Acts 26, verses 19 through 20. Uh, he was explaining he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but he declared uh, uh, his purpose first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and then throughout the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. And what did he say they should do? They should repent and turn to God and do works fitting of repentance. In other words, demonstrate it. Don't just say the, uh, uh, talk the talk. You should walk the walk. So recently, point two of the example about Paul or Saul, when he stumbled across the truths of God, he failed to recognize the value of the treasure in the field. He was persecuting those. And then God rubbed Saul's nose into the truth. And that's when Saul became Paul. Not only was this Saul, later named Paul, a Pharisee in Acts 23, 6. He hated Christians and he actively participated in imprisonment and killing of Christians who followed the way. Yet God had a different path for Paul. Rather than persecuting the Christians, Paul became humble before God and gave the rest of his life for the treasure in the field, meaning that road, that path to the kingdom of God. So that's the second point. Uh, first point was about the children of Israel in the wilderness. Second one was about Paul having a road to Damascus experience. The third example about uh, conversion and baptism is in Acts 8. We're in the book of Acts. We're starting in verse 26. In Acts 8, and starting in verse 26, it's the story of an apostle named Philip. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, along the road which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Well, Jerusalem's had a high elevation, and every place else is going downhill. So go down toward Gaza, which is on the Mediterranean coast. This is desert. So he rose and went. Now, that little comment about this is desert will come into play. And he rose, and there was a man from Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury had come to Jerusalem to worship, which is interesting that the queen of Ethiopia had knowledge of the truth and was coming to Jerusalem to worship. 
and who had charge of all of her earthly possessions or substance and money was uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. And while he was, says, <clears throat> and sitting in his chariot, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah the prophet, and the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So you have horses pulling a two-wheeled uh, wagon, as it were. Now, and generally, a person with that authority isn't driving their own chariot. So it's sort of like having a chauffeur, okay? So he doesn't have to. He's probably sitting in the back of the chariot. The driver is taking care of the driving, just like you might imagine somebody sitting in the back of a limo, reading a newspaper or a book while the driver is getting, taking them on to their destination. Verse 30, and, uh, and Philip ran to him and hearing the reading of the prophet Isaiah said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch, verse 31, it said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. So now they're in the back of this chariot, a little two-wheeled wagon, uh, carting along, going downhill from Jerusalem uh, to Gaza. And the place in the scripture which he read, was, in fact, I'll just I looked it up. It's Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And, uh, and he's talking about, uh, about the lamb, the uh, uh, sheep to slaughter, and so forth. Verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say? Is this of himself or some other man? So he's reading the prophet in the book of Isaiah. Remember the scriptures at that time or what we call the Old Testament today. And not everybody could read. But here was a learned man, a powerful man. And he was saying, what does this mean? You know, and, and so then verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. In other words, and what did Jesus preach? The kingdom of the gospel, uh, uh, of the coming uh, the gospel, of the coming kingdom of God. And... That must have been some awe. Remember, they're going through a desert on the way. And verse 36, And when they down went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Words, he understood. He accepted it. He was searching for truth or he wouldn't have been reading scriptures, just like the merchant of the pearl of great price. He was seeking understanding and truth. And when it came... He understood it, he accepted it, and was willing to take action. Verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both the Philip and the eunuch went into the water, and he, meaning Philip, baptized him. <clears throat> and so God does the calling. It's a choice for people to respond. We read this in 6 John 6.44. Uh, John 6, 44, no man, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So it's a choice we have to respond to the call of God. And God teaches us then, just like in the next verse, John 6, 45, just like he taught uh, Saul to become Paul. In John 6, 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Well, how does God teach us? It's through a scripture, use of the word of God, and we learn that through the scripture. Well, there's going to come a time in Amos 8, 11, when there will be a famine of the hearing of the word. <clears throat> in Amos 8, 11, Behold, the days are coming, said the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. Notice the word of God doesn't go away. That's still there. But people don't or won't hear it. And there is a famine, meaning it isn't, it isn't easy to be heard. The Bible is then filled with references to what's called the way. God the Father called us. We've been shown the way. And some of us have come to that understanding like stumbling across a treasure in a field. We had to give up everything in order to obtain that treasure. Some of us found, uh, were actively searching for the pearl of great price, the truths of God that lead us to the kingdom of God. Well, just as the tribes of Israel inherited the promised land under Joshua's leadership, and just as the Ethiopian eunuch was traveling with Philip in the chariot, 
and seized the day to become baptized into Christianity. And just as Saul was struck down on the road to become blinded, regained his vision to become the newly verted Christian and become the Apostle Paul, just as each of them have a story, we have a story, each one of us, how we came to conversion. In fact, it's a pretty common subject during the feast. Well, how did you come to know the truth? So now is our opportunity to grow, to strengthen our conversion week by week. It's our opportunity to put into action our faith that we might be strong as we approach then the spring holy days in a few weeks. The paths to understanding the kingdom of God requires daily choices that affect our lives and the lives of those around us. Now, <clears throat> earlier we talked about uh, uh, physical paths, roadways, maps, and so forth. But there are other pathways besides just the physical path. One of those, for example, we have to make choices every day, is about our individual health. That each individual choice we make each day has an effect on our long-term health. There's another path, our educational path. Whether it's a formal education or a vocational education, or just daily personal improvement, do we have a plan? Do we have a path? Maybe there's an occupational path. Do we just stumble through life? Sort of like, well, we're pretending it's on purpose, but everything's an accident. <clears throat> I mean, I would have never predicted that I would have had the occupations I have. Uh, and it's kind of almost embarrassing. Now, as I look back on my life, and look at, I've had several jobs in life, but I never got a professional job that I applied for. You know, all those times when you put through references and resumes, in my entire life, I look back on it and say, you know what? For the last 50 years, every time I applied for a professional job, I didn't get it. And yet somehow, I wound up with a series of professional jobs. It was sort of like that was a very different road than I had anticipated. But each one of them led me to the next possibility. Now, there's also a social path in life. What path are we on there? Now, people with an active social life, they live longer. Uh, and so, uh, what path do we have to improve our social lives? Now, <clears throat> there's the mate selection path. I give a speech to the last... Uh, before retiring, the last speech I gave to high school seniors uh, before uh, uh, retiring from uh, as a high school teacher. And I gave it on the senior banquet and I had used my time about the most important economic decision that they will ever make. Well, I'm an economics teacher, so they were all paying attention. They had, I had had them all, but I had never given <clears throat> this speech and said, the most important economic decision you'll ever make is your mate selection. Do a good job of mate selection and you can work together. And that's the synergy of one plus one equals three. You're going to step forward uh, uh, better. <clears throat> and apparently that resonated. The next day, the English teacher, uh, because the senior banquet school was still, uh, still going, the English teacher in his class made a parody uh, video of that speech and put it up on uh, YouTube uh, about the most important choice you will ever make. So apparently somebody heard it uh, and went along the way. Um, but all of those other paths, the most important one is the spiritual path that we're on. Are we going God's way toward the kingdom of God? Or do we go a different route? And the Bible tells us there's other routes we can go. We can pick other ways. Jude 1 verse 11 in the book of Jude, verse 11, we can go different routes, but those don't lead to the kingdom of God. And this is really another message, but I'll just list the three ways that are listed in Jude one eleven: The way of Cain, the error of Balaam, or follow Korah's rebellion. People do all of those things. So that's the alternative. So which way are we going? Well, I think it's probably a good idea to avoid the pitfalls of Cain and, and Balaam and Korah. But instead going through the examples of what we understand about the uh, treasure in the field or the pearl of great price and valuing that, that we must renew our hearts daily in order to recognize the treasure in the field and that pearl of great price 
as we each travel on our road to the kingdom of God. Thank you.